Yeah. So Mohamed Makia returned to England, to Liverpool in 1946 and discovered a very changing city. Um, he said in his memoirs, I saw Baghdad styled with a new look modernized by the new shop fronts and the newly laid roads. And to illustrate uh, this uh, modern era in, uh, in Baghdad, you, for your book, you worked on three uh, specific artists. So, uh, yes, in 1946, when Makia returned to Baghdad, um, Baghdad was basically on its way uh, to, to being modernized. And it's also notable that in 1946, Joa Salim left Baghdad to study at the Slade School uh, yeah. from 46 to 48. And that's where he met um, his uh, later to become his. Sorry. In 1946, Jawad uh, went to the Slate School. That's where he met Lorna Selim, who later became his wife. Yeah. And, uh, in the 1950s, specifically, the first uh, group of modern artists was created uh, with Faiq Hassan, the Rawad group. And Jawad was part of that group. But then Jawad left in a, a year later to form with his students, uh, Shakir Hassan Al Saeed. Uh, and uh, Lorn Salim, Mohammed Ghani Hikmet, who joined a few years later. But basically, they formed the Baghdad Modern Art Group, which is historically the first group to have a manifesto uh, that is now we can also read in English according uh, to this uh, important publication by the MoMA and, and thanks to Nadesh Shabot as well in, in putting that together uh, with the other authors. So what we see here is in the 1950s is that modernism taking shape um, in, a, in a very strong way, in, uh, both in painting and sculpture. And we focus on Joa Selim here because he was uh, the dynamo um, of this uh, modernism. And his ethos, according to the Baghdad Modern Art Group, is to look at Mesopotamian and Islamic heritage through prism of the modern masters through the European uh, uh, modernism, uh, uh, i.e. it doesn't mean that in order to um, show your connection or your inspiration to your Islamic or Mesopotamian heritage that you would copy it exactly, uh, neither that you would divorce it completely and uh, immerse yourself into European modernism, which can be foreign to your land but to find uh, a, a middle ground between both of them uh, and to look for themes that are local at the same time they are uh, universal. And in, in that sense, uh, you can see that Jawa Selim managed to find one of these important universal themes, which is the theme of the crescent. Uh, he used this theme of the crescent, uh, which as we know, uh, the crescent appears in several civilizations it is very important in Sumerian civilization. Uh, then we see it in Islamic civilization as well, and Islamic heritage, uh, in Ottoman and Byzantine uh, uh, heritage before that. Uh, and it is a, a symbol that is universally uh, basically recognized. Everyone has seen the moon, everyone has seen yeah. the crescent. And, and this is the brilliance of Joa Selim, is, is to find this uh, single vocabulary, which is both regional and universal. And we see it in both of these examples, for example, uh, the painting or, or the, the, um, uh, the, the study for the, the famous painting, the watermelon cellar, uh, which you have the sketch of here. And you can see that the crescent, if you're focusing on the crescent, it appears in different forms within the painting. And here he used the uh, modern uh, uh, basically techniques uh, by, for example, the Fauvism of Matisse or the structure of uh, Matisse and his odalisks, uh, as well as the Cubism from Picasso and uh, the different works of Kandinsky, Paul Klee, etc. Not to say that he's copying them, but he's more in a dialogue with them, that he wants to create something that is modern uh, but at the same time, uh, they have a different different depth and richness to them that alludes to Islamic and Mesopotamian heritage. 
Um, so the, the motives that you see in the drawing and the deconstruction of the figures will give you uh, different patterns that uh, can lead to, for example, the discovery of different crescents, as in the crescents in the watermelon, crescents in her face, crescents in the lamp next to her, crescent to the fold of the curtain on top of the head of the sitter. Yeah. And then you see that as well in the uh, sculpture, as in this uh, uh, bronze relief, uh, Pastoral from 1955, mm -hmm. where you can see that he deconstructed the bowl uh, to uh, crescents. Uh, and even there is a, uh, a cockerel and a, a hen at the bottom of the painting. That they just look like two uh, cute little crescents. Uh, there and the woman figure on the right is also different repetitions of you know crescents. Uh, uh, but the rendering of this, for example, as a bronze relief, and you can see specifically the two palm trees. Uh, one of the palm trees is very much distinctively uh, Assyrian, which is you know like it's a half circle, uh, half circle or semicircle. Um, uh, uh, palm tree, while the other palm tree uh, is more like a modern uh, cubist palm tree. We've never seen a you know palm tree as a square, yeah. but this is you know like it's a very simple innovation uh, to put it uh, together. So, Jawad Salim uh, is a, a very important driving force for modernism in Baghdad, and this modernism in art exemplified through the work of the Baghdad Modern Art Group, inspired Mohammed Makir. Yeah. Uh, modernized his architecture as well uh, to give it this connection to the past and to look into the future. Because Mohammed Makir, before the Khulafa Mosque, was a very modern uh, architect, as in, you know, in the, in the sense of the Bauhaus School and Ben Nicholson architecture. But his architecture after the Khulafa Mosque completely changed. It became... Uh, architecture that gives you this connection to the past, but at the same time, it is uh, modern, very much like the works of Joa Selim. And he mentions that, Makia says that he was influenced by Joa Selim. Joa Selim managed to do an art what uh, others in architecture could not do until, uh, and here we can see that there is almost 10 years between what Joa Selim created and what Mohammed Makia created. Great, yeah. So an another, um... Uh, Iraqi artist that you work on for this uh, chapter, Mohamed Ghani Hikmat. Yes, so Mohamed Ghani Hikmat is more of a continuation of that collaboration uh, sought between uh, Makia and uh, Jawa Salim. As we know, Jawa Salim passed uh, away prematurely in 1961 yeah. due to exhaustion, some heart problems when he was still installing the Freedom Monument uh, after finishing, you know, casting yes, uh, yeah. Lawrence. Uh, and during that time, uh, or let's say in the early 60s, Mohammed Ghani Hikmet, who was a student of Jawa Salim, and also worked with him uh, in Florence uh, to help him with the Freedom Monument in terms of the you know, creation of it and the casting. Uh, Mohammed Ghani Hikmet returned to Iraq, and he held his first solo exhibition, in the house of Mohammed Makia. Mohammed Makia, his house in Mansour, uh, was not only as a house, but it's also like one of these uh, important art salons where yeah. people meet and intellectuals, etc. So the, Mohammed, Mohammed Ghani Hikmet did his first solo exhibition in that house. And then Makia wanted to uh, um, basically uh, continue or to pursue uh, one of the ideas of the projects he was working with Joa Salim on, which is how to modernize local craft. So with local craft, you have a continuity with the past, a direct continuity with the past, a craft that is carried on in generations within the same family for hundreds of years. But yeah. then how do you make it modern? How do you make it relevant to the modern age? And the first experiment he did was with Muhammad Ghani Hikmet in terms of architecture, where he commissioned him to create a, a wooden door for one of the houses he was uh, designing in 1960. So if you know the date, 1964, so this is after Khulafa Mosque. Exactly. So before Khulafa Mosque, they did not have this sort of, uh, you know, uh, element. Hmm. 
So uh, Mohammed Ghani Hikmet here, of course, um, uses expertise and experience uh, in creating this door based on a previous work that he did in 1950s when he was studying in Rome. And he did uh, 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 wooden doors, wooden gates for a church, for a specific church in, uh, in Italy. Uh, where it had um, um, Christian, uh, um, let's say, Christian icons on them, uh, Christ, so on. Uh, but here he wanted to create something local. Yeah. So uh, he looked at the designs of the different doors and uh, the artifacts that were available at the Iraqi Museum. Uh, and he conducted a historical study into the different types and motifs uh, of uh, wood sculpture. And then he created this door. Uh, which we don't have a specific title for it, but there is another uh, book published in the 90s by, uh, sorry, in 2000 something by Mohammed Ghani, where he calls his door Bab Shamasi. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the sun, um, you know, something related to the sun. The sun, yeah. Mm. And, and you can see clearly the crescents make their way into here. But again, this is not a crescent that he's copying directly from Joa Salim. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a, in conversation and uh, in, in continuity with it. And this door, uh, or this kind of experiment with uh, Mohammed Makir, led Mohammed Ghani to also change his uh, uh, cultures. So his cultures, for example, instead of them being rounded, traditional, three-dimensional, they also became more of uh, sorry, they also became more of uh, motifs uh, and uh, uh, reliefs that you can see a repetition of these patterns and uh, taking these basic shapes as the crescents and other elements of, from Islamic and Mesopotamian heritage as a sort of abstraction and modernization uh, into uh, sculpture. Yeah. So then we have... Uh the Iraqi artist uh, Lorna Selim that you choose to work on for your chapter to illustrate uh, modern Baghdad. So, uh, yes, part of the modernism that Mekia was uh, pushing uh, in uh, Baghdad, according, uh, let's say, in addition to other uh, pioneers in between 1950s and 1960s, uh, was Lorna Selim because he asked Lorna Salim to be one of the artists who were teaching at the Department of Architecture in uh, Baghdad University. And Lorna Salim uh, obviously was uh, very well known to Mohammed Makia. They had a you know, close relationship because his wife, Margaret Makia, was also very close to uh, uh, Lorna Salim. And she was a founding member of the Baghdad Modern Art Group. And we have this important historic work in the Makia collection uh, from the 1957, which you can see it's a local scene from uh, Baghdad, uh, woman, one of the women on a donkey and another woman working with her, uh, walking with her, sorry. And, and this work was exhibited in the 1957 uh, Al-Mansur uh, Club, which was considered as one of the examples of showing Lorna Salim as a a tempered medium between the modernism, the geometric maybe modernism of uh, Joa Salim on one hand, and the uh, modernism that has more of some sort of a realist influence in the works of Fayyad Hassan. And uh, we see that, for example, Lona Salim, during the years that she was teaching uh, in the Department of Architecture, she was looking more into architecture with her students uh, and they uh, produced several uh, drawings of the houses on the uh, uh, banks of Tigris, on both sides of uh, the Tigris on Rasafa and Karf, which uh, are an important um, body of work, or let's say a phase within the, the over of Lorna Salim. And then later on, uh, it, also in the 1960s, we can see that the work of uh, Lorna Salim as in this example from the Delular Foundation, uh, was becoming closer to uh, the geometric abstraction uh, and the motives that she possibly was exploring with Jawad before he died. Yeah. 
So in the work that you see in the Delul Art Foundation, again, if we're talking about the crescent as the element that you would get from uh, Jawa Salim, uh, then also these elong elongations um, in, the, in the form uh, and uh, breaking the form into uh, 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 basic shapes, you can see it explored here in the, in the work of Lorna Salim clearly. So in 1966, the Society of Iraqi Artists was founded, as you said, and Mohamed Makia, sorry, and Mohamed Makia was elected the first uh, president. Um, one year after, he organized an exhibition of the group at the Al Mansur Social Club in Baghdad, and a second one at the Olympic Club in Baghdad the same year, right? Exactly. Um, so. The, uh, one of the participants were, uh, was Faye Hassan, that we have here some works. And these works from the Makia collection entitled was exhibited during this uh, exhibition. Yes, uh, this uh, work comes from the historic Mansour exhibition 1957. Yeah. Um, and it's depicting two women. Uh, again, this is from the local scenes that the Rawad group was very much looking into. Yeah. Uh, the local scenes of a woman called uh, Alabat. And, and Alabat, it means women who uh, carry uh, containers. Containers are Alab, Alba. Uh, these containers, they have buffalo cream. So these are women who are actually crossing, crossing from. Um, uh, let's say from a rural scenes to the urban scene daily because they live on the outskirts of the city They come very much from a rural background. They live with buffaloes as we saw in that work from the pastoral 1950s and they would take the buffalo cream Then they would come at dawn into Baghdad and they would start to sell it uh, To people it's like fresh, you know fresh cream dairy product uh, and uh, here five Hassan was during that time was experimenting with different forms uh, of modernism in a like a noble competition between him, uh, his group at Rawad, and Jawa Salim and his group, Baghdad Modern Art Group, and the third group, which is Al Antabaeen, the Impressionist by Hafid Durub. But then, as you can see, that uh, while we have this great work of Fayyid Hassan in 1957, uh, a few years later a few decades later in 1975 you can see also bedouins which were an important focal point for uh by hassan yeah in this work of the the lular foundation uh but it's it's a very much realist in its uh, uh in its technique and this uh let's say departure uh, from something that is very modern to something more realist yeah has with the fact that uh, Fayyad Hassan dedicated his life to be as a master teacher of painting in Iraq. And because of him, we have a very strong tradition of realist painting, yeah. uh, academic painting, uh, in a sense. However, it is focused on uh, the Iraqi locale, uh, focused on uh, different elements that doesn't have to be, or they don't have to be uh, urban, they can be a very much rural, uh, very much um, uh, nomadic, as in these Bedouins that we see in this uh, in this beautiful painting. Yeah. And um, why was it so important for these uh, artists uh, to represent uh, local uh, scenes in their works? Uh, they, they, it was important for them to represent local scenes uh, in their work, especially, especially the generation of uh, Faiq and Jawad, because the generations that followed them, they had different goals and they had, uh, let's say, um, different aspirations. Yeah. For that, that group, it was the, or that generation, it was the first generation to look into something that is local to you, i.e. familiar, but to modernize it in something that is foreign to you, unfamiliar, which is one of the great senses of you know, making any piece of art is how do you combine the familiar and unfamiliar into something 
that has enough balance in it to draw you to it, to give you an attention, uh, exactly. give you some sort of tension that, uh, that you would consider it uh, to be something that is very close to you, you can identify with, but at the same time, it's something that can be easily read by someone who is not from your culture. Exactly. From uh, other cultures. So this, I would say, is possibly the undertone or the great uh, denominator uh, between that group of the, of the 50s is, and, and we can see that as a term, for example, also possibly in architecture is the, the, the term uh, international regionalism. Yeah. Regional, but at the same time, you're international. And we can see that in, in these works of, uh, you know, by Hassan Jawasili, specifically from the 1950s. Yeah. And then we have the great master, Shakir Hassan Said, uh, which is also part from this generation from the 50s. Yes. Uh, so Shakir Hassan is slightly younger, obviously. He was a student of Jawad and a colleague. Um, and uh, he was one of the few artists who studied at the Institute of Fine Art uh, after having completing a bachelor degree. Yeah. So, for example, uh, I, I can't tell you every possible name, but the, there are three or four uh, artists who we know that they had a bachelor degree, so they had a, you know, an advanced education before going into the Institute of Fine Art. And these would be Riyal Azawi, who studied archaeology, and he uh, graduated in 1962. Kalvam Haidar, uh, who studied literature, and, uh, and Shakir Hassan, who studied social sciences. And uh, to a, a later date, or I think maybe at around the same time, we have Ala Bashir, who was a, a doctor, and uh, he was studying medicine, or maybe he just graduated, and he was also enrolled in the uh, Institute of Fine Art. So, uh, for Shakir, Shakir Hassan, in a sense, is a mature student who yeah. comes into art with a different background, with a you know, social sciences background. And uh, he developed quickly within the 1950s uh, that within one decade, so between 1951, when he uh, embarked officially with Jawasa in the Modern Art Group, within 10 years, he reinvented himself in 1961 into uh, a form of abstraction, uh, paying homage to uh, uh, the Sumerian uh, art in a way which he explored 10 years earlier in this example in 1951. Yeah. Um, this important uh, painting in 1951, it could have been in the exhibition of the you know, inaugural exhibition of the Back of the Modern Art Group. However, we don't have a record to know for sure. Uh, but there's something that can be said about Mekia is that he managed to collect very important points uh, or very important examples to study starting points and turning points in the work of uh, Shakir Hassan. Yeah. So we have this work 1951, and then we have his most important or largest painting, Vagabond Family, that we saw on the slide earlier, yeah. 1961. And there is also another work uh, that I put on my Instagram page, which I, I just came to realize it is actually one of the earliest examples of Shakir Hassan using the Arabic letter yeah. in 1964, just one year before uh, he issued his uh, uh, manifesto, Bayan uh, al Contemplative Manifesto, about Hurufiyya and about al Bu'd al Wahid, you know, one dimension. In the 1950s period uh, for Shakir Hassan, uh, you can see. He is working closely with Jawad Salim because obviously he was a, a co-founder of the Baghdad Modern Art Group. But while Shakir Hassan, uh, while Jawad Salim, for example, looked at um, uh, archaeology and al wasati specifically as a source of inspiration, uh, Shakir Hassan was looking into folk art, or, or sorry, Shakir Hassan was looking into folk art as a source of inspiration. And he considered folk art to be a continuation, a natural continuation of any heritage that was there without specifying which of it was Mesopotamian, which of it was Islam. Uh, and in this uh, painting from the 1951, uh, you can see there are different motifs in it, the opposing triangles that come from yeah. Sumerian art, 
uh, also the piercing gaze uh, in the face that we see here, but also the geometric abstraction that comes from uh, European masters. Um, one of the things that were fascinating him uh, as well were the cockerels. And cockerel, as we see in this uh, drawing, and this comes from a sketch actually uh, from the artist that was not exhibited uh, until 2011. Uh, in 2011, I organized a, a commemorative exhibition for Shaka Hassan at the Humanitarian Dialogue Foundation, uh, where we combined uh, drawings and sketches and studies by Shaka Hassan, comes from his family, directly from his uh, son who lives in London, Rabia, uh, with paintings and works that are in the Mekia collection. And we put them together in an exhibition for the first time. They were not exhibited. Uh, and it's what's fascinating to see, especially in, in these works on paper, uh, is the uh, his focus his like he's super focused on things that you would see in local life. So here, what what you're looking, you can't, for example, see a car, you yeah. can't see a modern machine, but it's something that is very uh, uh, rural uh, in in a sense and is very local. Yeah. Uh, could have been there for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, in, as in, you cannot, so we're talking in terms of uh, spatio-temporal analysis. Uh, you can identify the space, but you cannot identify the time. Uh, so this is one of the things that, you know, uh, Shakar Hassan was in, interested in. Uh, so for example, uh, this one, this uh, cockerel, also has different um, uh, some symbols to it. So cockerel is also uh, a symbol to uh, um, male-dominated society. It is an important symbol that comes to us from the 1001 nights or the Arabian yeah. night because it is the end of you know another night, for example, when you hear the cockerel. Uh, in addition to the cockerel also is one of these universal symbols that uh, Picasso uh, and other artists were also exploring, and we see it in other works. So, for example, in this period, possibly, we could say possibly that if Jawah Salim discovered the crescent as a universal regional symbol, Shakir Hassan was looking into cockerels as a universal regional symbol. Yeah.